This is the 14th video in a series devoted to abstract linear algebra, and we're finally ready to look at the notion of a matrix. It took so long because we've been taking an abstract approach to linear algebra. And along with looking at the notion of a matrix, we'll also look some, at some arithmetic properties of matrices. Okay, so let's start with the definition. So let's suppose that we've got any arbitrary field called K, an M by N matrix with entries in K is a rectangular array of elements in K with M rows and N columns. So I've written it like this. So here I've named my matrix capital A, and it's pretty standard to name matrices capital letters from the beginning of the alphabet. Although sometimes you would use U, capital V, X, Y, Z, but generally A, B, and C are good names for matrices. Let's also notice that we've double indexed the entries here. And that's because we've got an array, so we need like a horizontal counter as well as a vertical counter. So this first row contains A11, A12, all the way up to A1N. The second row, A21, A22, A2N, all the way down to the mth row, which is AM1, AN2, and AMN at the very end. Okay, and then sometimes you write this just in terms of an arbitrary entry, and that would be AIJ. So thinking about the i component is telling you which row you're in and the j component as which column you're in. Okay, before we look at some of the arithmetic of matrices, I want to introduce a couple of more basic concepts that will help us do stuff down the line. First is the set of all m by n matrices with entries in k is denoted by the following symbol. So it's mat, so like the start of the word matrix, underscore m by n k. So that gives us the size of our matrix, and that gives us the field for which we're taking the entries. Next, it's often helpful to have some notation for just talking about the columns and the rows of a matrix, and we'll use the following notation. So if we've got a matrix A, then the columns will be described by A upper one, A upper two, all the way up to A upper n. And so just as an example, A upper j would be this thing A1j, A2j, all the way down to Amj. And sometimes you would call this thing a column vector. And in fact, this is exactly how we wrote vectors when we were talking about vectors in Km. So you can think about each of the columns as being a vector on its own. And then you can put all of these columns together to rewrite the matrix as this row of columns. So notice this thing goes down M entries this way. This one does too. All of them do. Okay. There's another way to do rows of a matrix, and we'll use subscripts for that instead of superscripts. So A1, A2, up to AM, those will be the rows of A. Notice we've got M rows and N columns. That's why those numbers are not the same. For an arbitrary row AI, we would have AI1, AI2, all the way up to AIN. And that allows us to write our matrix as a column of rows. So each of these are going across. And now this is like essentially what we looked at as vectors before, but on its side. So we sometimes call this a row vector, and that's in Kn because there are n entries. Okay, so now that we've sorted out some of the jargon of matrices, let's maybe start to look at some of the arithmetic involving matrices. So now that we've got our basic definitions taken care of, let's define what it means to add two matrices. So in order to add matrices, they have to be exactly the same size. In other words, they have to same, have the same number of rows and the same number of columns. So that's what we're starting with. A is a matrix which has entries A, I, J. B is a matrix which has entries B, I, J. And they are both in this set mat M by N, K. So in other words, they have M rows and N columns. Then we can define their sum 
via the entries that are building the sum, and the entries are just the sum of the entries here. So in other words, the ij component of a plus b is the sum of the ij component from each of these. Okay, well, this is maybe needlessly complicated because if we look at a couple of examples, then we'll have it immediately. And really, there's not a lot going on here. It's just if things are in the same location in each matrix, you add them. So here we're doing a sum of two two by three matrices in R. So that means we're working over the field of real numbers. So we want to add these top left entries, one plus negative two. So that's going to clearly give us a negative one here. Then we have three plus five. That's going to give us an eight here. Seven plus zero. That'll give us a seven there. Then let's see, 8 plus negative 3, that'll give us a 5 in this entry right here. Negative 3 plus 4, that gives us a 1. And then 5 plus 1, that gives us a 6. So the sum of these two 2 by 3 matrices gives us that 2 by 3 matrix. And all we did was just kind of line up entries one at a time, add them to get the corresponding result in the output. So really, there's not much to it. We just did six different addition problems. Okay, so now let's do the same thing down here. We've got different size matrices. We have two by two matrices. These are sometimes called square because they have the same number of rows and columns. And in this case, we're also going to be working over a finite field. So this is the field of integers modulo 7. We called that F7. So let's work this out. So we have 1 plus 6, that's equal to 7, but in F7, 7 is the same thing as 0. Then we have 3 plus 5, that's equal to 8, but 8 is equal to 1 in F7. 4 plus 5 is equal to 9, but 9 is equal to 2 in the integer modulo 7. And finally, 2 plus 3 is 5, which we just leave as 5 in the integer modulo 7. So we'd be left with this matrix right here, 0, 1, 2, 5. I think that's probably enough for examples of just straight addition. There's, like I said, there's really not much to this. Okay, so let's maybe get rid of this and we're going to look at another arithmetic that we can put on matrices. Now we'll define the notion of scalar multiplication with matrices. So for that, we'll need a matrix. I've called it A again, and it's an M by N matrix with entries in K. And then we'll need a scalar. So I've called that alpha in K, just to kind of go with the same notation that we've been using in previous videos. Then the scalar multiple of A by alpha, which we'll write as alpha K, is the matrix with entries alpha A, I, J. So in other words, the I, Jth entry of the scalar multiple is the product of alpha with the ijth entry of the original matrix. So again, I think the easiest way to see this is just with a couple of examples because there's not much going on here either. All you want to do is think about distributing your scalar multiple onto each of the entries in the matrix. So for my first example, I'll again work over two by three matrices with entries in R. So I'll take five and then scalar multiply it with the matrix 9, negative 7, 4, 0, 2, negative 1. So this is straightforward. So we'll get a 45 here because that's 5 times 9, a negative 35 here, a 20 here. Just because of multiplication, we'll get a 0, a 10, and a minus 5. So that's really all there is to it for scalar multiplication. So let's look at another example where we're working over finite fields just to make it a little bit more interesting. So let's say we're over the set of two by two matrices with entries in F5. So that's the integers modulo five. So we'll multiply four onto the matrix four, two, three, one. So let's see, four times four is 16, but 16 mod five is one because it's one more than 15, which is a multiple of five. Four times two is eight, but that's three because it's three more than five. Four times three is 12, but that's two because it's two more than 10. And then four times one is four, which we'd probably just write as four. So that's that scalar multiple, keeping in mind that we're working over a different field.
Okay, so now that we've got an addition of matrices and a scalar multiplication of matrices, that really hints towards the set of matrices having a certain structure which we've been working with. And that's what our next result will address. So what we'll prove now is that the matrix addition and the scalar multiplication that was defined on the previous boards make this set of M by N matrices with entries in K an MN or an M times N dimensional vector space over K. Okay, so how can we do that? Well, let's take an arbitrary matrix AIJ N mat M by N K and also define E i j to be equal to the matrix with all zeros except for the i jth component. So let's write it like this. So the matrix with all zeros except a one in the i j component. So by the component, I mean we're in the ith row and the jth column. So you guys can like write an array of what this looks like, but I think it's pretty clear. Like if we think over here, all of these would be equal to zero, except we went down to the ith row and the jth column, and we'd have a single one in a C of zeros. Okay. But now if A has entries A, I, J, and we've defined these things E, I, J, then we can in fact write A as a linear combination of these E, I, J's using our matrix addition and our scalar multiplication. So let's do that as follows. So we'll just say observe that A is now equal to A11, E11, plus A12, E12, all the way up to A1N, E1N. So that populates the first row of A, but then we can keep doing this for all of the rows of A until we end up at the last row. So the last two entries will be something like this. So we'll have um, a m n minus one e m n minus one plus a m n e m n. Great. And so notice that this sum on the right hand side will most definitely give us this type of matrix. And that's because e i j is the matrix with all zeros except for a one. So when we multiply it by the scalar a i j for instance, that's going to be a matrix with all zeros except for this scalar a i j in the i j component. But then by our definition of matrix addition, when we shove all of those together, we retrieve this matrix, which just just to remind you, it has this expanded form over here. Okay, well, let's maybe point out that all of these AIJs come from K, so that's something subtle to import, uh, point out, and all of these EIJs come from mat M by N K. Great. But look at what we've got. We've got a linear combination of these EIJs with weights AIJs. So this is in the span of the set EIJ as I goes from one to, let's see, I counts the number of rows, so that'll be M, and J goes from one to N. Great. But what did we just do? We showed that an arbitrary matrix was in the span of these um, matrices, but the span always makes a, makes a vector space. That's something that we proved earlier, and that didn't even require anything to do with the structure of that, of that vector space. We just take the span of vectors and we get a vector space. So that immediately tells us that we have a vector space. Now, what about the dimension? So to finish off proving we have an M times N dimensional vector space, we'll need to show that this set right here is linearly independent. But there's actually not much to that. So let's notice if we take the sum and say that it has to be equal to the zero matrix, then because there's no interaction between any of these EIJs, 
that tells us that all of these a i j's will have to be zero, but that gives us linear independence. I would say maybe as a good exercise to write down all of the details for linear independence, but as you'll see, it comes pretty quickly. Okay, so I think that's good for the proof of this theorem. Now we're gonna work towards the multiplication of matrices. Now that we've showed that the set of matrices has the structure of a vector space, we're ready to start talking about matrix multiplication. And the way we define matrix multiplication might seem kind of crazy at first, but when we look at multiplication by a matrix as being a special type of linear transformation, which we saw before, or we saw linear transformations before, we'll see that this is really the correct way to define uh, the multiplication of matrices. But that'll be a couple of videos from now. Okay, so we'll start by multiplying an M by N matrix and an N by 1 matrix, also known as a column vector. So I've named my matrix capital A. It has entries just like this over here, but I've rewritten them. So A11 up to A1N, all the way down to AM1 to AMN. So that's going to be in the set of all M by N matrices with entries in K. Then I've got a vector V. I'll say that it has entries V1 down to VN. And it's in KN like we discussed before. Okay, so now let's define this product, and this is important that we're defining this way of doing matrix multiplication. There are probably lots of ways you could define a multiplication of this type of object with this type of object, but like I said, the way that we'll define it will be a specific example of some generalized ideas that we've already seen. And we'll prove that specificity a little bit later. Okay, so A times V will be the following matrix, or really it will be an M by one column vector. So it'll be A11 V1 plus all the way up to A1N VN. So you can think about taking this first row right here, swiveling it across, and then the numbers that match up, you multiply them and then you add. So notice we've got A11 times V1. So the next one will be A12 times V2, all the way down to A1N times VN. And that becomes our first entry over here. So it's wide, so it looks like it might be a larger array, but this is a sum, so that's just a single entry. And then that's gonna go for all of those entries ending down here with a m1 v1 plus all the way down to a m n v n but let's notice that this is an m by 1 matrix or in other words an m by 1 column vector so this is in km so let's notice we took an m by n matrix and multiplied an n by 1 vector and ended up with an m by 1 vector. So that's maybe something that's kind of important enough to write down here just to get us an idea for the size and shape. We have m by n matrix n by 1 vector equals m by 1 vector. Okay, so the important takeaway here is that in order to multiply this matrix to this vector, we needed these numbers right here to line up. So there we've got those two ends are the same. And then the numbers on the outside give us the size. So here this M matches with this M, that gives us that size. And then this one matches with this one, that gives us that size. Okay, so let's maybe get rid of this and we'll look at some examples. So here I've got two illustrative examples for this matrix vector multiplication. So we'll start with a two by three matrix times a three by one matrix or a three by one column vector, thinking about the base field as being the real numbers. Okay, so keeping that in mind, how are we going to do this? Well, the idea is, like I said, you take this first row, think about swiveling it to hit this column vector, the numbers that line up, you multiply, and then you add them. So let's see, that'll give us one times three, so that'll be three, plus two times negative two, so that's minus four, plus three times one, so that'll be plus three. So that's our first entry.
And we'll probably do that more quickly as we move on, but just for our first case, let's write all of the details. Then the second entry will be repeating that with the second row. So we have negative four times three, that gives us negative 12. Zero times negative two, that's zero. And then five times one is five, so plus five. So in the end, you see that we get, well, that's six minus four, which is two. Negative 12 plus five is negative seven. So let's notice that all of our sizes work out. This, like I said, is a two by three matrix times a three by one vector. And that leaves us with a two by one vector over here. Okay, nice. Now let's do another example where we have a matrix with three rows and two columns times a two vector. And let's say we're working in the field with three elements here, so that's the integers modulo three. Okay, so let's work out our calculation here. So for our first, first entry, we'll take this first row, swivel it, so we have zero times zero, one times two, so that gives us two. Then for our second entry, we have two times one plus one times two. So that's two plus two, which is four, but in F3, four is the same thing as one. Then finally, we have one times one plus two times one, but that's one plus two, which is three, but in F3, that is equal to zero. Okay. Now again, let's make sense our let's make sure our sizes make sense. So this is a three by two matrix. This is a two by one column vector, and that leaves us with a three by one column vector. So everything lines up like we saw in the definition. Okay, so let's get rid of this and then we'll talk about matrix matrix multiplication. Now that we have matrix vector multiplication, we're ready to define a more general matrix matrix multiplication. And just like we saw with matrix vector multiplication, the sizes of each of the components that we were multiplying was important. The same thing's going to be true in matrix matrix multiplication. So in this case, we'll multiply an M by R matrix and an R by N matrix. So let's get ourselves set up. We have a matrix A, which is our M by R matrix with entries in K. Then we have our matrix B, which is our R by N matrix with entries in K. Furthermore, we've written B using our column notation like we did before. So B upper one is the first column, B upper two is the second column, all the way down to B upper N is the nth column. So notice we need n columns because this is an R by n matrix. Let's just recall that since B upper I is the ith column, it in fact has R entries, so we can think about it as an element from KR or an R dimensional vector. Okay, so now that we've got this and we have our matrix vector multiplication, we can define the matrix matrix multiplication pretty easily, and it goes like this. So A times B will be the following matrix. So it will have columns defined as follows. So we'll have A, B1. But notice, we know how to multiply A and B1 by our previous definition of matrix vector multiplication. And then A, B2, all the way up to A, B, N. Great. And now let's just do a size calculation. So let's look at this. We have A is what? M by R. And then B1 is, let's see, R by 1. So that means this product will be M by 1. Great. So after taking this product, we have, let's see, M total rows, because each of these will be M by 1 vectors. So that means in the end, this thing is an M by N matrix with entries in K. That's because we have N columns defined by those columns up there, and then M rows because of the product that we had on the last board. And now let's notice that everything is working out pretty similar to what we had before. We started off with an M by R matrix and we multiplied it to an R by N matrix and got an M by N matrix. Just as we saw before, these inner things have to match. 
And then this M right here gives us the number of rows for our output. And then finally, this N right here gives us the number of columns of our output. Okay, nice. And then maybe while we're at it, I want to write down a all-in-one formula, which is equivalent to this. Although I think this is maybe a more intuitive way to write it. So let's do that via entry. So let's say A is the matrix AIJ. Let's say B is the matrix BIJ. Okay. Well, then A times B will be made up of entries of the following form. So this is going to be the sum as L goes from 1 up to R of A, I, L, and then B, L, J. Okay, so that's pretty fancy, but notice that the i jth entry is this sum of the products of terms. But if you look at it carefully, that's exactly what you get with this kind of matrix vector definition of our matrix matrix multiplication. Okay, so anyway, let's get rid of this and we'll look at some examples. All right, so let's start with these three examples where we're taking our entries of our matrices to be in R. So in other words, our base field is R. So let's start by multiplying a two by three matrix to a three by two matrix. And we'll use the same strategy that we did before, but we'll kind of simplify it a little bit as we go through it because via example, it's kind of easier to see these things. Okay, so in order to get this first entry up here, we'll take the first row here and the first column here. So we take this row, swivel it into this column. Everything that matches up will multiply and then we'll add. So we'll have one times two plus two times five. So that's gonna be two plus 10 is 12 plus one times or negative one times zero. So in the end, that is 12. Okay, so just to reiterate, we took this first row, swiveled it into this first column, that gave us that entry. Now we'll take this first row, swivel it into this second column, and that'll give us this entry right here. So let's see, we'll have a one times one, plus a two times six, and then plus a negative one times one. So in the end, that'll also give us a 12, because the one times one and the negative one times one cancel. Okay, now let's move on to our second row. So our second row will give us the output of our second row here. So our second row in our first column will give us this entry right here. So three times two is six plus five times five. So that'll be six plus 25, which is 31. We don't need to worry about the seven times zero because that's just zero. Now we move on to our second row and our second column. That'll give us our final entry here. So we have three times one, that's three, plus six times five is 30. So 33 and then plus seven times one. So that will be 33 plus seven is 40. So we end up with that two by two matrix. And just by a calculation of our expected size, we know that we've got the correct size here. This is the two by three matrix times a three by two matrix. And that gave us a two by two matrix. Okay. So let's notice that we could multiply those in an opposite order and we would achieve a three by three matrix. So Sometimes you can multiply matrices in different orders. You will often not get the same thing. Sometimes you won't even get the same size of object. So if we were to instead have this matrix on the left, we would have ended up with a three by three matrix, a totally different size. So that lack of commutativity is highlighted by the following example. So we'll take the following pair of two by two matrices and multiply them both ways. So let's do this first one. So we'll take our first row and our first column. So let's see, that gives us two times five is 10 minus one. So that's nine. Two times two is negative four. So that gives us negative four. We've got a zero there, so we don't need to worry about it. Three times five is 15 plus five. That gives us 20. Three times negative two is negative six. Again, the zero doesn't contribute anything. 
Okay, now let's do the product in the opposite order. So we'll do five times two, that gives us 10, minus six, that gives us four. Already we can see we're not getting the same result because this entry four is not the same as that entry nine. But let's keep going. So we've got five times negative one, that's negative five, and then minus 10, so that's negative 15 here. And then one times two is two, and then zero times three, that doesn't contribute anything, and then one times negative one, that gives us negative one. So let's notice that here, if we call this A, we call this B, this is B, A, then their products are not the same. In other words, we do not have commutativity. And I wanna stress that only when you have square matrices can you even compare the outputs. Often they don't have the same size or it's not even defined to multiply the matrices in the opposite order. Okay, so now that we've got this, I'll leave you guys with a couple of warm-up problems. Okay, so here are two warm-up problems. The first is a little bit tricky, but not too bad if you're just careful with all of your bookkeeping, and that is to prove that the two definitions presented for matrix multiplication are equivalent. So in other words, this definition where we use the definition of matrix vector multiplication and expand B via these columns is the same thing as this kind of one and done definition where we just have this like entry right here. Okay, so I think that's a good warm up problem. And then here's one more which is more calculational based and that is to multiply this three by four matrix to this four by two matrix. Maybe do it three times thinking about the ground field each time. So the first time over the real numbers, the second time over F5, and the third time over F11, so the field with 11 elements. And that's a good place to stop.